dealing with the subset of ultra-fast lasers from amongst the very many lasers that we've heard about today. Um, I could go back and say in the past, of course, go back further than Tony did, because really Isaac Newton in the 17th century was the person that really gave us a better feel for what optical spectrum was, optical bandwidth, and you'll see how that very easily connects with some of the things that I'll be saying about the generation of particularly the very, very short laser pulses. And then fast forwarding to 300 years, mid-1960 well, in May, uh, we've heard about Ted Mayhem, we've heard about the first CW lasers and so on that brought the laser era on board, and that, of course, was key. Um, it's quite interesting that, that given the developments that were happening in 1960, that as early as the spring of 1961, Bob Hellworth, in a conference in, in, in the States, introduced this idea that especially for a ruby that had a long upper state lifetime, there would be a way by which you could frustrate lasing and, and really build up the population inversion to get shorter, more intense pulses, originally called giant optical pulsations. Later, you, the term, of course, became Q-switching because you were Q changing the quality of the cavity. Uh, Kerr, by the way, was the student of Lord Kelvin working in Glasgow. So there's quite a strong uh, UK connection in this, and I'll mention Kerr's name again later. Now, the theoretical outline of moving from that nanosecond regime, or the thoughts of moving away from that, really came with the recognition that dealing with the optical modes of resonators, that there might be a way by which you could phase lock them together <coughs> And the way by which that might be done would be some sort of intracavity loss modulation, for example, and you'd do that at the cavity frequency. And we're now talking about 1964, and mode locking of a helium neon laser. Now, that had the advantage there weren't too many modes to lock up. But you can see with acousto optic modulation, again in 1964, Hargrove, Falk, and Pollock published the mode locking, a practical system that showed mode locking of a laser. Now, the ruby laser did exist, of course, and we had the mode locking of ruby laser in 65. But this is a very key step forward in the use of a, something called a saturable absorber. An absorbing material, usually in those days, a, a dye solution, which at high intensity would have suppressed absorption. In other words, the absorption was becoming saturated. So you could use the intracavity radiation itself to be a means of doing the loss modulation. It's also significant and ties in with what Colin was saying previously that measuring pulses became something of a challenge because even then these pulses were emerging and the recognition was they were significantly shorter than a nanosecond and so for the photodiode oscilloscope combinations that were being used to display these pulses clearly there was an instrument limit and you had to do better than that and I'll mention a little bit about how the, what the challenge of measuring these pulses happened to be. So we moved on because really the neodymium glass laser that had been brought on board was the one that showed a very large bandwidth and potentially able to produce uh, sub-picosecond sub -picosecond duration pulses. And again, using citable absorbers, it's quite interesting the point that Professor Towns was mentioning about looking across the disciplines. It was very interesting that, that Tony De Maria, working at United Aircraft Corporation and doing some of this work, when he was looking at some of the initial Q-switched profiles, he could see that there were some sort of mode-beating effects or some fine structure happening on those Q-switched pulses. And he recognized that that was evidence that there was some coupling of the longitudinal modes going on. And he was able to cross-correlate that with work that was done there much earlier by Cutler, but working in microwave uh, waveguide feedback circuitry and using a so-called electronic expandor circuit. And Tony, I think, was really the first person to get a good sort of engineering feel for what was going on in these mode lock lasers. So he was able to think in terms of an equivalence with a passively mode lock laser. So I think we can learn from other disciplines and from other uh, activities. We can understand that system very well, and in very simplistic terms, what you can say is that if you have a laser and you've got a comb of modes within the the longitudinal modes within the resonator, then if you take one of those modes and amplitude modulate it just as the same way as in radio frequency, you generate sidebands, and the significance is if you, if you do the modulation at the cavity frequency, 
These sidebands coincide with neighbouring longitudinal modes. So in principle you can connect these modes in a coherent fashion from the initial mode to its nearest neighbours, higher and lower frequency, and then similarly to keep going down this comb on either side, and so ultimately you engage a very, very large number of modes. And the larger the number of modes, the shorter the pulse duration that you can potentially generate. It depends on pulse shape, but you can see that if you have a bandwidth that's lazing, not the gain bandwidth, there's a bit of confusion in some of the early literature, but the lazing bandwidth times the pulse duration, in the case of Gaussian pulse is about a half, hyperbolic secant squared pulse is about a third. But the key thing is broad lasing bandwidths enable the generation of very short pulses. And one of the key people that, that really helped with the understanding of the modelling of this, both for fast cytable absorbers and also for slow cytable absorbers used with dye lasers, there's some of the lasers that Colin mentioned um, in the Dan Bradley context earlier. Uh, this is where Jeff was showing that if you had um, 101 modes, the centre mode and 50 on either side, and they're not correlated, then you just get noise. And so the phase of those modes is going to plus and minus pi. But if you phase lock them together, you have the possibility of generating a discrete short pulse. <coughs> Work done at both uh, Queen's and Belfast. So this is really a little animation. You can see that there's, there's 30 modes there. And the, the blue is just if those modes are not phase correlated. And the red is that if they are. So you can see that a small number of modes shows that you can um, really bu start building up a pulse from noise and it becomes very discrete and that's about 80 modes. Uh, I carry on to the end of that, it goes up to 150. And even at 150, you can see there are many. But you may have in a broadband laser something 150,000 modes. So you can understand how intense that pulse would be, how clean it would be, and how distinctive it is compared to the un, uh, uncoupled modes that you just get from a noisy laser. So it's an evolution of discrete pulses, provided you can do that mode locking well and make it work. So now you've got the choice. You either say, I'll take one of these longitudinal modes and I'll make my laser output spectrally very pure. And of course, that's the basis of spectroscopy, <coughs> narrow line spectroscopy. Or you can take many, many modes lasing above threshold and then couple them together in a phase and you get a periodic sequence of pulses. If it's a flash lamp pump laser, you get a finite train of these, or if it's a CW laser, then you get an infinite series or sequence for those. So, as I say, in the early days, making pulse duration measurements was difficult, and the idea was that you might use nonlinear techniques, allow the pulse to measure itself, essentially, and the typical early techniques that were being used were two-photon fluorescence or second harmonic generation, either just intensity or fringe resolved. And as Colin mentioned, there was quite a lot of work being done in the development of fast electron optical street cameras because although the photodiode oscilloscope combination didn't have enough resolution, it had the nice attraction that it was a linear response device so you could look at background to pulses and so on. So it was still quite key. Um, I don't think we need any earlier reports um, just yet. Now, here's the photograph that, that Colin showed. The only comment I would make is, here's Dan Bradley in the middle. He reminds me of the, the country singer Johnny Cash, and all those around him look like the inmates of San Quentin Prison. <laughs> because they all look amazingly sober and serious. Now, that's before Roy Taylor and I joined the group, and things changed irreparably after that. But here was considered to be, if, if you were good in the lab, this was the hallmark of success. If you could have a short pulse coming in from something in the adamium glass laser, bisected in intensity and sent in two directions to coincide and collide in a, in a dye solution that would have two photon absorption and subsequent fluorescence. If you could see this fine line in the TPF trace, then you were considered to be good in the lab. If you couldn't, then Dan lost interest in you. Here was street cameras as, as uh, Colin mentioned Dan was quite keen to translate from lab activity into commercialization, which he did for both mode lock dye lasers and also street cameras. And some of you in the audience will recognize Bill Sleet and Alan Neville here. You may not recognize them quite so well at the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that, that company ran for quite a number of years. We carried on at both Imperial College and St. Andrews working on these street tubes 
um, especially running them continuously or synchronously with CW lasers, and we got down to uh, resolution to around about a picosecond, but Roy Taylor at Imperial did a lot of work looking at, at dye uh, fluorescence trace and recovery times and so on um, well into the 80s using street cameras uh, in conjunction sometimes with Dan Bradley, who had by that time moved to Dublin. Now, the way of, gen the way of detecting pulses today sounds more like biology rather than laser physics. We've got frogs and we've got spiders, um, but we've got frequency-resolved optical gating, which tells you something not only about the intensity and the spectrum, but the phase. Uh, and similarly, that's Turbino and Kane. Similarly, with the spectral phase interferometry done by Ian Walmsley, formerly Rochester, now at Oxford, uh, very fascinating ways by which you can interrogate in great detail the quality of the pulses and understand very precisely what's going on in modern sources and also in the application sector for those. You will see I've also added here at a second streak photography, the idea of going from picosecond streak photography that we were interested in right through to at a second. And I think two of the most spectacular pictures that I could show you, it's the one taken by the, the stroboscopic techniques used by Harold Edgerton. He's the E of E, G, and G, by the way, uh, working at MIT. And this is for a one microsecond exposure, a beautiful, beautiful picture showing what happens when a bullet passes through an apple. Now, the next frame of that is just this stock, and he called that collateral damage. Um, but here's a, a fascinating picture, and you might be surprised. I actually won the Progress Medal of the Royal Photographic Society here in London in 2006. And what makes this picture remarkable, and I'll mention how it comes about a little bit later, but you can see that here's a red wave, an optical wave of a, of a red laser pulse. And this, the, the periodicity here is two femtoseconds. So from here up to the top and back down to the center is one femtosecond. And taken with the attosecond X-ray pulses, you can see you can resolve that one femtosecond very easily. So the resolution here is probably 200 attoseconds or better. Femtosecond 10 to the minus 15, attosecond 10 to the minus 18. So an absolutely remarkable picture. So I think they're both remarkable in their own uh, distinctive ways. Now let me just then take you through what I will mention briefly in the rest of this talk, which is a fast forwarding history of what has been happening in these short pulse lasers. I've mentioned that the mid 60s it all began in terms of concept and demonstration. Then we had the picosecond pulses from flash lamp pumped lasers like nadimium glass and dye lasers. Then we moved into femtosecond lasers from CW dye lasers, continuous wave dye lasers. Also quite a work, lot of work done with color center lasers, pioneered by Lynn Mullinar at Bell Labs and carried on to a large extent in this country too. Um, chirp pulse amplification as a technique for amplifying these pulses mid-80s. Um, then care lens mode locking that you'd be surprised if I didn't mention that. Um, and then moving on to some of the impressively wide range of lasers that were uh, both developed and implemented over the years. Now I call this an Imperial College version of a colliding pulse femtosecond dye laser. Uh, I think probably the beams are quite difficult to see. There's a red beam, a red thread of a beam snake, snakes around that cavity. But we in Imperial decided we didn't want to drill holes in these lovely optical tables, so our dye jets were horizontal. Most other laboratories in the world, the dye jets were vertical. But ours were horizontal, which meant that our prisms were in the vertical plane. Uh, very photogenic and very nice, and provided you had all day to line it and all day to work with it, it was a very nice instrument. However, it was complicated, it was inefficient, and if you got anything in the way of the dye jets, you went home with a different color of shirt. So, and all the rest of your garments matched it very well. So, here's the idea that you could get this. The problem was that by the time you set this up, you had a sightable absorber here, which greatly restricted the operation of the laser. And for a dye laser, even though you had a Rotoman 6G dye, typically with a broad band for gain, it usually <laughs> operated around about the 630 nanometers uh, region. So there's a lack of tunability because of this type of absorber. And the other thing was the, the Q of the cavity had to be quite high because the gain wasn't all that high. And so with a 1% output coupling, you would tend to get just a 2 or 3 or 4 milliwatts of average power. So it was very limited in what it could do. But despite that, it was the workhorse of the, the 70s and the 80s in terms of doing experiments 
in uh, short pulse physics. A lot of fascinating work was done in so many areas, including uh, femtochemistry and femtophysics, excellent semiconductor physics, and so on, right across the world, despite the limitations of that laser. But what was recognized was that in the dye jet, where the intensity was quite high, there was clear evidence that you had some sort of a, an intensity-induced refractive index change. Uh, and that was really the basis of the fact that at high intensity, you get a refractive index that's larger. So although that coefficient tends to be very small, if the focal power or the focused intensity is very high, then that can become significant. And so that became a means by which you could actually think about exploiting it. Now, I'm cutting out a few steps here, but exploiting it in a titanium sapphire laser. And I have to acknowledge titanium sapphire is a gain material. Ruby is chromium doped sapphire. This is titanium doped sapphire and behaves very, very differently. But the, the tribute must go to Peter Moulton at MIT Lincoln Labs, who in 1982 published work on what became a tremendously important gain crystal for the rest of the 80s and continues to be the case today. But now we're talking not about the care effect that, that Hellworth was demonstrating with the Q-switch laser um, at the beginning, but it's the optical care effect. Um, and the idea is here that you can exploit the optical care effect in two ways. If you think of that beam coming in, I've drawn it pink here, but think of it being green, coming into this material, it could be glass, or it could be the titanium sapphire rod itself in the laser. When it comes in, think of it being green, so think of that as being colored in green. Coming through, you generate frequencies higher and lower, so you get red shifting and blue shifting, so it becomes whiter. So it's like becoming a white light spectrum. So that's what's, that's what's really been trying to illustrate here, that a beam coming in that is in the form of short pulses can actually create new frequency components, <coughs> enlarge the spectrum. Now, an enlarged spectrum is great because that gives you the possibility of even shorter pulses. So that's called self-phase modulation. Here's something else that was parasitic up really until these times where when you're amplifying pulses in glass laser amplifiers, for example, there was always a problem when the intensity became too high, you could damage the amplifiers. And the reason for that was if you had powerful pulses coming along as a beam, and the beam being a Gaussian cross-section, intense in the center, as the beam would propagate, you can see you get a retardation on the wavefronts. In other words, this is behaving like a lens. So if it's behaving like a convex lens, it'll focus the beam down, and if it's too severe, there's the possibility of focusing the beam inside the gain material. And that was a big problem for some of the early uh, phosphate glass amplifier uh, rods that, that subsequently became large disks. But here is something whereby you can actually have some beam control, spatial control on the laser. Now, what, what I'm showing here is that if the intensity is low, in other words, if the modes are not well correlated and it's just a bit of noise, and you've got this set up inside a cavity, and for instance, you might have an aperture in the cavity, well then, as that beam passes through the gain material, you can arrange the cavity design such that that represents very significant loss. So as that beam comes to the aperture, you can see only part of it transmits, so it's significant loss. If you start building up pulses then, uh, the advantage is that when you've got pulses, you've got this lensing effect, and all of the beam goes through the aperture. So here's a high intensity, low loss. The same as a cyclical absorber in effect, but not dependent on a physical cyclical absorber and not something that limits or restricts the tunability. So that was a very, very key uh, aspect of that. And so you could then go back to simple lasers. So you could go back and build a Thai sapphire laser. You didn't have any cyclical absorbers. You didn't have any liquids involved. It was all a very dry, clean system. And you could design it in such a way you'd have some prism purely from the point of view of dispersion compensation to keep all the components of the spectrum together. You could have a slit that just changes where you want to tune the laser to, and you'd have an aperture to perform this role of, of helping to uh, <coughs> concentrate on generating short pulses. And so a broad bandwidth, very broad bandwidth, so you can generate pulses down to a few femtoseconds. Unrestricted tuning range, you can either use it all and generate very short pulses or use a subsection of the spectrum and, and have some degree of tunability, that's an option. But look at the powers you now had. And this, this was first demonstrated in the lab in 1989. Whereas in the dye laser, it was about an average power of two milliwatts, so here they're a thousand times higher. And the pulse durations were very similar, so rather than the one kilowatt typical of a dye laser peak power pulses, now you had a megawatt 
coming straight from a laser oscillator, and that gave rise to an enormous amount of applications in nonlinear optics, up conversion and down conversion from very powerful lasers, but importantly, uh, very, very much simplified lasers. Now, you could still relax some of the constraints in this by adding uh, semiconductor cyclic absorbers, and that's been done quite a lot, but it does restrict the tunability and the power. So that was a, a key step, and of course, if you've got a, a continuous sequence of very, very short duration pulses, delta functions, if you like, in time, the Fourier transform of that, or the spectral picture of that, is a comb. And of course, Ted Hanch made very good use of these lasers and was rightfully awarded the Nobel Prize in physics in 2005. Now, you can downsize them. The original ones were pumped with argon ions, so they were uh, quite significant in size. Um, you would expect coming from St. Andrews that I have to get a golf ball in somewhere. Um, but you can actually bring them down because what this was was, a, again, a chromium doped gain material, lithium strontium aluminium fluoride, but pumpable by red laser diodes. So you could have a little red laser diode pumping a very nice compact little system. And the interesting thing about that was you could battery pump, pump it, uh, it would work all day, and it would give more power than a dye laser would, but the total invested drive power, every part of the system, was about half a watt. So there was an enormous improvement on efficiency. So here we were, we'd gone from something quite big to something quite compact, something clean, but really very, very much more efficient. In fact, in the 20-year period, 84 to 2004, we reckoned that we had increased the efficiency of lasers from about 10 to the minus 5% up to about 10, 14%. If you could do the same for a combustion engine, the world's your oyster, so there's still prizes out there to be had. I'll not say very much about fibre lasers. Dave will probably touch on fibre lasers and all aspects of fibres. But just to say there's a number of fibre femtosecond lasers around. This is a UK one, spin-off from University of Southampton. Uh, IMRA and other companies, of course, do this. But again, you can make very compact and OEM-compatible uh, systems. Uh, work that we've done at St Andrews showed that you could actually take quantum dot, multi-layer quantum dot semiconductors, and with a, with a sort of a a two-section device, we could produce femtosecond pulses, 400 femtoseconds, but they're very high rep rate because you're dealing with a cavity that's only two millimeters long, uh, so it's about 20 gigahertz. And the, the, the peak powers are therefore relatively modest. So it's, it's horses for courses in terms of the applications. We do, of course, know that there's a lot of work that's been done using femtosecond lasers to excite microstrips uh, to get terahertz radiation and that's been used to very good effect in a number of laboratories. Uh, uh, this work was originally done at IBM by Dan Guskowski and colleagues. Um, but the idea is that you just fire in the short pulses, generate the terahertz, and the terahertz is quasi-optical. It behaves just like an optical beam, so you can take the source and send it and direct it to where you want to use it. Um, that's actually very, very useful because this is a company in, in Cambridge, uh, grew out of Toshiba, and, and uh, the, the idea here is that uh, you can look down through a skin lesion. So this is looking down through layers of skin. One of the problems with a, with a lesion on the skin, when it comes back here, you can see that looked at just on skin, in, in visual observation or looking with normal light, you don't really know where the margins of that lesion actually are. But if you take terahertz, then you can see that as you go down, and it's the layers below this that are important, you can begin to see the margin of that lesion is actually quite widespread. So surgeons need to know where that is. So terahertz, uh, very, very important uh, going forward. In terms of what you can do, micromachining, Colin mentioned micromachining earlier, you can take these very intense beams of very short pulses, focus them inside uh, glass, for instance, and create conditions of change uh, that represents the possibility for waveguide circuits in optics, and so you can build three-dimensional structures just by translating the laser beam through a piece of glass. You can do the same in terms of making microfluidic channels, and so you can have optofluidic chips containing many, many, many options of uh, device structures and device options for various biological applications. You can fit those in and bring them right down to single cells by doing optical trapping. You can look at some of the trapping dynamics 
or you can actually change what happens in terms of the cells and introduce aspects into cells. So here's work that, that we do at St Andrews which is related to transfection. The idea being you can transfer exogenous DNA into a cell. And those of us living in this country are very aware of Dolly the sheep. And when you see videos on TV about Dolly the sheep and the progress that that was, you would see under a microscope, a little uh, microscopic syringe needle coming into a cell. And as the syringe needle penetrates the wall of the cell, it distorts the cell. And you can see the cell being distorted and then recoiling. So it's a massive impact on the cell as well as the cell nucleus. Now what we can do today is to replace that physical syringe needle by an optical syringe needle. And the reason for that is that we can take a laser beam, we can focus it onto a cell and create pores, and that increases the diffusivity of some medium that wouldn't otherwise enter the cell. And so you can do it in a very contamination-free system. But what we can do in the laser is get a, a bessel-like beam, an undifracting beam, so that the thing behaves just like a needle of light. And so you can take this needle of light and with optical manipulation, you can take DNA and make it enter the cell. And even though the cell wall is moving in a living cell, you can still have this needle of light going into the cell and penetrating the cell. So it's a marvelous way of really upgrading what has been done in conventional biology in this process. We know it works because the cells not only go in, but also the cells proliferate and they live and they're happy for many days to come. I said to you that I would mention this idea of chirp pulse amplification and the reason for that is it's a very, very important adjunct, a very important transition in the laser world, especially the ultra-fast world. And the idea is that you take a short pulse, if you pass that and try amplifying it directly, the intensities are very, very high. So the idea is that you spread it out and make it a long pulse and then amplify it as a long pulse and then compress it safely at the end. And you see Donna Strickland and Gerard Moreau published that in 85 but if they'd realized, they could have gone back to 1960 and they would have seen that Cook did it for radar pulses. So in fact, what was being rediscovered in optics had already been well known in radar. And so I think we in our own world of, of lasers and ultra-fast lasers and so on are sometimes very guilty of not realizing just what has been done in other sectors. And I think Professor Towns referred to that, that we need to keep ourselves open-minded and aware of what's going on in other sectors as well as our own. But what you can now do is you can amplify these pulses up to multi-petawatt levels. Um, sufficient that you can tear electrons off atoms. You can do absolutely fascinating plasma physics and a whole bunch of other things that I don't have time to mention. But here you can see that here's these optical waves inside this pulse. Uh, if you take a sinusoid, for example, the linear part of a sinusoid is a sixth of the period. Now, if this is an optical wave with a period of two femtoseconds. The linear part of that is roughly a third of a femtosecond, 300 attoseconds. So here's a 300 attosecond field change. You can tear electrons off, the field polarity changes and drags the electron back to impact, creates soft X-rays coming off this atom now, and these soft X-ray signatures are in the attosecond regime. Automatically, by that gradient and by that discrimination, you're now into attoseconds, attosecond physics. And so here is a, a photoelectron spectrum taken at the uh, Polytechnic in Milan uh, by Nisoli, and you can see that you can begin to really understand what's going on with photoelectrons uh, being produced by attosecond XUV pulses, and the resolution deduced from that picture is 130 attoseconds, 130 times 10 to the minus 18 of a second. You can do marvellous work in, in sort of ion-matter interactions, a lot of work going on in combining titanium sapphire oscillators with neodymium glass amplifiers, um, and I should say that you can now do extreme linear optics by taking femtosecond pulses through gas atoms, and as distinct from having Röntgen's tube of incoherent X-rays, you can now have coherent X-rays, and this is, I'm just using a slide from uh, Margaret Murnane and Henry Captain's group at Jilla or NIST at Colorado. So here's, here's coherent X-rays with which you can do holography and so on. Yeah. Just finishing, I just want to say that we have in this country the Central Laser Facility. Um, it was really promoted originally by Dan Bradley, Alan Gibson and, and Stuart Ramsden. Does absolutely wonderful work in terms of national collaborations of research as well as international collaborations 
Um, it carries out plasma physics. I've highlighted ultra-short pulse physics here and related theory and computation. It's, it's headed by Mike Dunn. And just to highlight something from the annual report of the last year, high harmonic generation that I've referred to, but also GEV acceleration of electrons with self-guided laser pulses, a whole array of new applications. So where are we going? Well, I've looked at the past, looked at the present, looking into the future. There are many UK contributions to the development and implementation of these ultra-short pulse lasers. We are still involved, uh, and we're hoping to persuade the ministers of science here to keep funding us so that we can remain involved in ultra-fast science and technologies. And we're looking forward to new eras where there'll be many new opportunities growing up in this field. So thank you very much indeed for your attention.